So there's Mira. She wanted to say hi. Hello. Hey, Mira. You want to say hi? They said hello back, okay? <laughs> the last time I did one, they were hanging on my back. So this time, at least, they're going to supposed to be going to bed. And they'll want to stay there for an hour or two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can we do this without our video on? Is that allowed? <laughs> is it? You'll have to ask Eric. I don't know. This is, I think, the second time I've been on one of these things. Oh, we this doing... is my first oh, oh really uh, all right hold on Ugh. wow the so next board member <laughs> no i wouldn't put her through that <laughs> sure you would no <laughs> not at all hi, hi isabel. isabel you're muted hey hello Hello. <laughs> hey. How is it that your hair looks good? I don't understand. Uh, my hair looks fine. I, I am a disaster. So. My regular. <laughs> <laughs> well, I combed, yeah. I combed both of mine before this meeting. <laughs> How is everybody? Good. Yeah. We're doing okay. Yeah. Hanging in there. Corona free. Right? That's the plus side. Corona free. I don't know uh, if I should keep my glasses on because if I want to read, I need my glasses, but then everybody will see what I'm looking at in the screen and that's distracting. So I don't know. I'm confused. I say take them on and off as you need them. Okay, good. Eric is muted too. Okay. So my question is, who is in charge Hiya. of responding to chats? Eric. Okay. Hi, Leah. Hey, how are you? Doing hey. good. <laughs> Hello. Hey, everybody. How are you? Good to see you. Good. Good. How are you? Good. 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 Is Tiffany joining or no? Uh, yeah, Tiffany is in. I just doesn't look like she's got her video on yet. I don't know if it'll be on, but she is present. Uh, Luke is here. It looks like we got everybody, and it looks like. Uh, hold on, uh, with uh, there's Tiffany. Sorry, let me do something here. Um, move this around, and there's that. Okay. <sighs> Who is Darren W? The chief. That is the fire chief. Oh, Darren White. That's right. That that would make sense. Sorry. <laughs> I forgot. Yeah, you'll get a chance to uh, meet him in a bit. It says we have 12 participants. Uh, in total. So we'll get into all of that in a second, Bill. That's, uh, uh, Jeff, it's 731, according to my world. So uh, if you would want to uh, call things to order, that is up to you. Yeah, Every, very all good. All members are present, so. Okay. Um, are we going to do a roll call? Uh, well, why don't you call it to order first, okay. and then we'll go from there. All right. Um, Opening session at 7, I have 7.32, and um, I wanted to invite our board secretary to do a roll call of the directors. Uh, sure. Do you just want me to go down the list then? Uh, I'll start with Director Green. Here. Director, uh, Board President Naylor. Here. Uh, Director Oyserman. Here. Director Perry. Present. And Director Shea. I am here. Excellent. Okay. We're good. Welcome, Chief. Um, okay. Well, I'd like to welcome everybody uh, to the May 13th Marinwood CSD board meeting. A um, couple of quick announcements. Uh, this is a virtual meeting of the Marinwood CSD board of directors pursuant to executive order N2920 issued by the governor of the state of California. There will not be a public location for this 
for participating in this meeting. Any interested member of the public can participate tele tel <laughs> I knew I'd blow that one, telephonically <laughs> or via internet by utilizing the web link or dial-in information printed on the agenda. Further, instructions for how to make a, a comment, for the public to make comment during the meeting. At points in the meeting when the meeting chair requests public comment, members of the public participating in the live meeting either via internet or telephone shall indicate their desire to speak. By internet, please click on the raise hand feature located in the Zoom application screen. If connected via telephone, please dial star nine and you'll be put into queue, I believe. Any questions? Everybody okay? Okay, moving on to item B, the agenda. Does anyone on the board have any changes to this evening's agenda? No. No. Okay, hearing none, the agenda is adopted as presented. We'll move on. Item C, introduction to introduce Darren White, our new fire chief. Eric? Yeah, I just uh, briefly, uh, he'll have plenty of opportunity to do some presentating uh, later, but you can see Chief White uh, there on the screen. Uh, chief White, as everybody knows, was recently hired as the fire chief for San Rafael, okay. which by default makes him the fire chief for Marinwood as well. Um, I'll let him speak to himself, but just really quickly, he has a... Uh, a 30-year professional career in firefighting uh, beginning in 1990. He was hired in Oakland uh, Fire Department in 1998. Uh, earned his way uh, as the chief, uh, eventually in Oakland overseeing 25 stations. Uh, he and I have had several communications since he has come in. We haven't really had too much opportunity to meet in person, but he's certainly been very supportive of Marinwood. Uh, right from day one and uh, so far it's just been a real pleasure to work with them so i look forward to uh, working with them further chief if you have anything you'd like to say by all means absolutely thank you for the kind introduction can everyone hear me absolutely okay. oh okay that's great um first of all I, I gotta tell you i'm excited i'm about a month in at this point and it's quite a different reality than i expected to come to san rafael and marinwood but you know what um no matter where I would be, I'd be doing the same work right now. And I'm happy to be here doing the work, helping the Marinwood and San Rafael and Marin County communities. And so I've got to say, this is um, something that I wouldn't have envisioned at the start of the year, but you know, life has a way of surprising you and putting you on a path that you never would have imagined. And I'm fortunate and been blessed in that regard over and over again throughout life. And so this is just one more of those opportunities for me to to serve and kind of fulfill my purpose and do the best I can to improve the situation for San Rafael, the Marinwood communities, the department members. And I'm, I'm gonna pledge to do everything I can to not only meet, but exceed your expectations that you have for a fire chief. I realize I have some pretty big shoes to fill behind Chief Gray, uh, that's not lost on me, but uh, the great thing is Chief Gray has been very helpful and supportive as I've transitioned into the role and I hope you guys will be patient with me as I try to learn the things that I don't know and look to do everything I can to, to meet the community's needs and the board's needs as well. So thank you. Oh. Absolutely welcome. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to the consent calendar. We'll be looking at um, the minutes from the March 10th meeting and the bills paid from March and April. Um, does the board, anyone on the board have any questions about anything on the consent calendar? No. I would like to move to adopt the consent calendar as presented. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further, any comment at all from anyone on the board? The refunds are starting to come in. That was the only thing I started totaling those up. I was wondering, uh, I didn't see anything on the water devils. Did we refund anything for them? Uh, we don't, there's nothing to refund for the water devils. They don't pay anything in advance. Um, oh, obviously okay. the, the terms of their contract will be modified uh, to reflect the existing season and uh, that they did have, and we are working with them on that. Okay. Okay. Because they refunded all of the money basically to people unless they donated. So. Okay. Thank Anything you. further from anyone on the board? 
Okay, I'd just like to mention one thing. I've had this conversation with the district manager, and from this point forward, we're going to put a link to the video, uh, the YouTube um, account that we have where we post all of the videos of our meetings um, so that people can refer to those as our, um, our meeting minutes are pretty much action oriented and have been for the last several months. Um, this would give anyone the opportunity to go out and drill down on some of the discussions that happen in the meeting. And that should happen with regard to this meeting's minutes, which will be published cool. shortly. Cool. Okay, I'll call the question. Everybody oh, in Jeff, favor? Jeff, open. Jeff, Jeff, hold on. You need to uh, request any comment from the public. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, you're right. Comment from the public. You do have one uh, person uh, with their hand raised, so I'm gonna, uh, we'll put them in. Okay. No, we see your name, Stephen. Um, Okay, thank you. All right, my apologies for the oversight. I skipped right over public comment. Is, are there any other members of the public that would like to comment at this point? Okay, hearing none, um, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Do you want us to raise our hand, Tiffany, so you Actually, could? we're supposed to do a roll call on this. Okay, okay. Yeah. Tiffany, yeah, Jeff, uh, just to be clear, if I can, Jeff, if I can jump in really quickly. So for each vote, uh, because they do also have uh, the public has the ability to call in uh, without wow. witnessing. So we're going to do each vote as individual voters. So Tiffany uh, will call out each board member individually and ask for your vote individually. Uh, so that way we have proper recording and it is uh, very much uh, clear who voted what. Just specifically also for those people that are on the phone. Correct. Are you, are you ready to vote? Yes. yes. I'll start with I'll start with Director Green. You're muted, Leah. Aye. Thank you. Uh, Board President Naylor? Aye. Director Oysterman. Aye. Director Perry? Aye. And Director Shea? Aye. Thank you. Okay, thank you. 
Moving on to um, item E, public comment, open time for items not on the agenda. Members of the public will have up to three minutes to comment on items that are not on this agenda this evening. Do we have anybody from the public that would like to speak? Yeah, one second here, uh, Jeff Adams, not on the agenda, here you go. Okay, Stephen. Stephen? Okay, I, I've lost him. I can't hear him. Stephen, uh, you must have muted yourself. Okay, I think there, you know, due to some of the comments that Stephen has made, I think we're going to be going through several things in tonight's agenda uh, that hopefully will help him feel a little bit more comfortable. Although, um, again, at this point, point in time, I, I am unaware of any particular budget for this uh, project, um, but from an overall budgetary standpoint, even given the um, situation that we find ourselves in now, I don't think things are quite as dire as he's painting, so I'll just make that comment. Um, are there any other members of the public that would like to comment during open session? Jeff, uh, as a reminder, you may just want to uh, let people know to, you know, they can raise hand to show that they would like to make a comment. And or if you're on the phone, star nine. Yeah, correct. Sorry, just in case people uh, didn't join at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Give them a minute. No, no further You're comment. Good. Okay, all right, thank you. We'll move on then. Item F, district matters. Um, item F1 is the draft budget for 2020-2021. Does the board have any questions or comments for the district manager? I'm, I'm happy to do a little intro here too, Jeff, if you... Uh... Sure, want. go right ahead. I mean, you've given us a, uh, a fairly thorough write-up on your assumptions and things, but yes, please do. Yeah, no, I did. The, uh, so just to, I did try to give you a detailed memo that's in here, um, and apologize while I look down at some of my notes, but uh, obviously the templates that I presented uh, are very different than all previous templates in that uh, what I've done is I've taken, you know, two basic scenarios, uh, in time to create the budget um, and looking at what a standard budget would look like uh, in a typical year versus a budget, uh, which in my case, I'm just kind of referring to as a worst case scenario in which we have no, uh, 
no summer camp, no pool, no anything like that. And then the other level of uh, difference here is that the far right column in the budget does not actually compare current year to previous year. It is comparing the two different scenarios, seeing as how it's really not an apples to apples comparison. I didn't see the relevance in comparing these two with the previous year. I thought it made a lot more sense to compare them amongst each other. The, uh, to also be clear, you know, I, I'm going to defer talk about uh, details of camps uh, or possibilities until later in the rec report. Um, but we are intending and anticipating operating some level of summer camp programming. Uh, and whatever that level is, is going to be guided by public health. And again, we can get into some of that uh, detail a little bit later in the, uh, in the meeting. The, uh, reality of the two budgets that I presented is it's most likely going to fall somewhere in the middle of there. I'm giving you the worst case of absolutely no summer um, and then the best case of hey everything is totally normal which isn't going to happen. Um, so the reality is it's going to be somewhere in between the, the two of these. Um, and unfortunately until we can kind of get that final guidance from public health which hopefully comes out soon uh, it's hard for us to keep putting things together, um, but again, we can get into that a little deeper. All I will say is uh, our rec staff, along with myself, have been very hard at work in anticipating scenarios, and we do have some levels of guidance to go with. Um, so that's helping us, so we're not just sitting here waiting for them to do something so we can then put everything together. Um, I also want to highlight the challenges of trying to do this, in that when you're looking at a fiscal year, yet our primary Revenue uh, and expense drivers on the recreation side are actually spread across two fiscal years um, in that, you know, summer camp starts one fiscal year and ends the next fiscal year. So when we budget, we look at this from a seasonal perspective, but then it typically gets put into the following budget year uh, and then it all kind of uh, comes out in the wash when you look at it over a multi-year projection. You just can't really do that when you're looking at you know large seasons like this that split right down the middle almost of a fiscal year um, and furthermore as I put in the memo we have no idea how to predict what the spring summer of 2021 is going to look like um, so right now this is just looking at the elimination of a summer to give an overall impact to the entire district-wide financial perspective um, that said even in the worst case scenario, it still shows a moderate gain of approximately 140 uh, net revenue over expenditure, 140,000. And that's after contributing to both our OPEB trust as well as our uh, uh, more towards our designated reserves. Um, so we're still able to achieve those goals and then. Uh, we are in a, I don't want to call it fortunate, but we're in a good position right now in that the district has performed well financially the last several fiscal years, uh, have been able to constantly increase our fund balance in addition to the OPEB trust, in addition to our reserve account. Um, and we're currently sitting on about 5.26 million in cash in our general fund. Um, so we are, we're in a, a good position, relatively speaking, to be able to withstand some of these impacts. Obviously, again, we don't, you know, if this goes on for a year, two years, we have to uh, take that when it comes. And then, uh, as you go down, I left a lot of uh, detailed notes on all sorts of line items. Um, you know, mostly just want to point out, you know, from a property tax revenue perspective, both models are consistent across the board and they're actually quite conservative. Um, and then as well as uh, other thing to keep in mind on the expenditure side is uh, items that are consistent across but wouldn't be if we don't have summer in reality and you know various utilities and select operating costs I've kept consistent because it's just very hard to gauge I can give you an example uh, I just opened up our gas bill um, for the pool month of April compared to the exact same month last year, it's $2,000 less. Uh, that's primarily because we're not heating the pool uh, with the pool shut down. So there's a lot of those other savings isn't the right word, but just expenditures that are going to be a lot lower because the use and the demand is so much lower than would typically be the case. Um, as I continue to go 
through this, just a couple highlights, you know, on the park budget. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think it's any secret to anybody. The park budget is already uh, very conservative just in terms of basic needs uh, and equipment to perform the work that's required. So there's very little, if any, difference between the two budgets. Um, higher budget is very similar. Uh, there's really, I mean, that budget is already kind of at a point where it's taking care of our basic needs. Uh, and equipment to perform the work required. So I think it is uh, not a lot of change that can happen there either. I mean, it takes X amount to operate a fire department. It takes X amount to maintain the parks. Um, the rec department is where the large impact obviously comes in. Um, you know, I kind of went through and did some of the math on it. Uh, just in the summertime, isolating that in a vacuum, uh, the net result of having no summer is about a $400,000 decrease in net revenue over expenditures. Um, so it hit, but we're able to balance that out with our other programs and then reallocating some of our property tax uh, revenue. Otherwise, any other uh, specific questions from the board, I'm happy to field. Understood. Isabella? Um, Eric, thank you so much. Uh, it's a very thoughtful budget and I appreciate the fact that you are giving us two opposing scenarios that really, um, you know, hopefully the reality will be closer to the more optimistic uh, version, but uh, we can't really tell at this point, so we have to brace ourselves for the worst as well. However, um, even under the worst of circumstance, we would still be um, up $140,000 um, in revenue over expenses. So even though we might actually forego the revenue of the summer camp, we would also not be incurring as many expenses as we would um, if we were to run the summer program. Hence, it is not a two or three million dollar deficit that we are facing um it is um just a foregone revenue um i have specific question about the operation of the pool this summer um given that it is very likely that uh, mass gatherings will not be allowed throughout the summer um I am questioning whether we should uh, close the pool for the, this year. And in order to make an informed decision, um, I think we need to know what is the um, variable cost differential between um, keeping pool operating um, and uh, potentially having some um, members or uh, residents come in for drop-in sessions um, versus just um, closing it all together. Um, so this question is either for Eric or Luke. I don't know who feels more comfortable speaking to it. Luke, if you want to go ahead. I mean, I, I would say on the pool, um, there has been, and this has been asked about specifically uh, amongst the public health officers. There is, at this point in time, they have released no guidance or even indications as to public pool operations, um, nor do I get the sense that that's coming anytime soon. I think it's kind of much farther down the road for them to analyze. So we, it's hard for us to know if we would be able to have a two month pool season or a two week pool season. My initial take on it would be that, I mean, we basically have shut the pool down for the past uh, several, you know, couple months, actually, several weeks. The, uh, personally, and I can speak for staff, I think, on this, and Luke, you're welcome by all means to jump in here in a second, but uh, I think the staff opinion is if we are able to operate the pool in a meaningful amount of time, in a meaningful capacity, we would prefer to. Um, I think not only for the community, but it's a huge asset to our camps. Um, that said, I don't know how optimistic I am that something like the uh, of public pool operating is going to be allowable anytime this season, just simply from a public health standpoint. And the uh, the uh, 
and then you have to look at, like I said, amount of time and what could be allowed and what restrictions would be in place. I think the days of having a couple hundred people at the pool at any given time is not going to happen at any point this summer. So we would be looking at really restricted operations. And I, we, it's hard for us to say what that means until we know what the restrictions are. Would it be lap swimming only for a limited number of swimmers at a time? Would it be some level of modified lessons? I don't know but I would be shocked to your point, Isabel, and I completely agree with you that it would have strict capacity limits. I just, I don't know what public health would do about it. And everything we've done from day one has been guided by public health. Yeah, and I can follow up. Can, can you hear me? I haven't tested my audio yet. Yep. Okay. okay. Um, <clears throat> great, thank you. But yeah, and just to add to that, thank you, Eric. Um, one thing that, uh, the pool to understand is right now we're not incurring a lot of expenses um, with the pool being dormant. Um, we're just running on very low uh, filtration, very little chemical usage and no heating. Um, we can ramp up pretty quickly. And in the event that we do end up um, having the opportunity to open in a limited capacity, whether it be to serve uh, the lap swimming community in a restricted way or to be able to offer some lessons or some small group use, whatever ends up um, being allowed, the costs of running the pool with a small user group are much lower than the cost of running the pool with um, the large crowds, which take a lot more chemicals and a lot more staffing, which are some of our big costs. So um, I'm optimistic that we can um, hold off on if, you know, depending on what we want to do, if we hold off on making a, an ultimate decision, uh, we won't be losing a bunch of money um, stringing the pool along until we know more. And then once we find out what um, we're allowed to do, uh, it may turn out that um, we'll, we'll need very minimal staffing to accommodate that. And um, the heating during the hot months is, is very minimal. Uh, chemical usage for a small group use is, is very low. And I think we may be able to um, accommodate some activity at the pool um, without, losing, without losing a lot of money. So um, I don't know that we need to make a, a huge blanket decision right away. Um, uh, we're, we're very minimal right now and, and kind of holding steady until we can uh, gather more information. So the so the lifeguard staff will be on standby until further notice, correct? As of right now, um, we the whole staff is just waiting and hoping they are going to be able to get some hours. And I have um, uh, full confidence that we'd be able to cobble a staff together very quickly. Uh, Stephanie is in touch with the staff um, fr frequently, kind of keeping them up to speed. And um, I know that you know when the time comes that we find out we're able to do something, it will uh, we will have plenty of of personnel to, to staff the pool. Thank you, I have no further questions regarding the budget. Okay, thank, thank you, Isabella. Bill, anything from you? No, I, I really like the uh, worst case scenario. So, and I know somewhere in between is where everything's gonna fall anyway. So, this is a good budget, I like it, so. Understood, thank you. Leah, do you have any comments? No comments, I agree. I mean, I think it's well put together, especially given the range of scenarios that we're looking at and all the unknowns. Understood, thank you. Sivan? Thank you, Eric, again, for putting together, like, I, like everybody has said, and I agree, it's nice to see the two extremes so that we know what our options are. Um, I asked Eric some questions before the meeting and he kind of answered them. So at this point, um, no, I don't have any questions. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> you know, clearly we're, um, we're in a different world right now and our timeline to approve the budget may be extended. That's one thing. But I would also like to comment um, that as things clarify, which will likely happen over time, there could be changes to the budget even after we adopt a final budget. Um, those are things that we should expect and we should um, understand. But I would like to recognize the ingenuity and the diligence of the entire staff in putting this budget together and providing the boundaries within which we will likely land. Um, that's good information. Um, also indicating that we're not in a um, egregious loss position um, given the worst case scenario should be relatively comforting for people as well. So I think um, it's indicative of the fact that the staff is um, 
been diligent in using our tax dollars wisely, and I salute them. Any further comment from the board on the budget? Okay, I'll call on the public if anybody would like to comment on the uh, budget. You, you do have comments, Jeff, so we'll uh, uh, bring them in one at a time. Okay, very good, thank you. Steven. I, I'm not monitoring chat. I see. Um, I didn't, I'm not entirely sure where some of your opinions are coming from. It did not appear to me that we are losing money or in a position to have to furlough anyone, but um, that's where we can agree to disagree. But thank you for your comments. Um, also, with regard to the pool, uh, my understanding is that the major maintenance um, that was once intended to do on the pool right away has uh, been. Um, opined on by experts and feel that it's not necessary for at least two year period. So I don't think there's any reason to move on that right now. Uh, I, I hear your opinion, yes. Thank you. Is this Erica. a give and take?
Okay, thank you again, Stephen. I, I hear your comments and your frustration. Uh, do we have any uh, additional members of the public that want to speak? Yes. Kim McNicholas. Yes, go ahead. Kim, you're muted. Yeah, you need to unmute yourself, please. Uh, are you on the phone, star nine? There I am. There we go. Okay. Yeah, I'm on my daughter's uh, thing because she has unlimited and whatever because of business. But anyhow, I had a couple of quick questions for you. Uh, I think Jeff might have clarified is that uh, I was asking about with this downtime and it had been budgeted to overhaul the pool, that why wasn't it being done? And I think Jeff mentioned the fact that you had had experts come in and said it didn't need to be done at this current time. Is that correct, Jeff? That is my understanding. Okay. I don't have a problem with that. How many years are we going to put this off or whatever did they say? Uh, Luke, do you want to feel that one? Um, sure. Yeah. So, um, we were initially concerned uh, with the condition of the pool shell and um, mm -hmm. we had had someone a number of years ago reference how many years we would get out of the pool shell and we were coming up on the end of that lifespan as we understood it. Um, since then we've had a few different professionals uh, look at the status of our pool shell and it's been uh, it's kept up much better than the original prediction and instead of um, doing a full replastering uh, we actually were able to hire someone to come out and do a number of uh, patch jobs on some areas that needed it um, with the expectation that would buy us another couple seasons before we need to address and, and potentially more if our um, if our shell is able to continue staying in the good quality that it's that it's currently in so that's that's where we are right now is that going to be done now during a shutdown you're going to drink it's, it's already been done patches. the patches have been completed already all they have. Great. Uh, the other thing, just follow up on Stevens Park uh, thing. I know Luke and Eric get emails from me regularly about the mini park and keeping it cleaned up and what goes on down there. And the biggest problem I've had is the drinking fountains, as all of you know. But the park, at least people are not dumping their gar garbage as they have been doing before. The drinking fountains are slow draining, but they're there. And I think the last email I sent to Eric, and I said, it's time for the spring cleaning of the weeds on both sides of the curb on Mellor Creek. I mean, Las Galinas, correct, Luke? And you said, yep, you're putting in the schedule. That's correct. Okay, so I look forward in the next couple of weeks to see the weeds taken care of and at the drinking fountains, if you can improve them. And I know in the shutdown or the slowdown with financial and all that, I'll just keep, keep you keep on top, at least of the mini park drinking fountain of what's happening there. And occasionally when I go around to the rest of the park on dog walks, but uh, the mini park looks good. Nobody's using it, I don't think. But I know a couple of times I've seen the signs torn down and somebody must have been using the swings. But that's my comments. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate it. To my knowledge, all parents are staying away from parks. For the most part, I think you're right. I've seen very little activity in the park. I walk at least two or three times a, a week around our entire perimeter and um, rarely see anyone in the park. That upturned um, sand hail has been in the same position in our major park for the last three weeks. 
Yeah, so. nobody's, go nobody's going <laughs> in, so. Yeah, indeed. Do we have other comments from the public? Nothing else. Uh, that's all for now, Bill. Or, uh, <laughs> it's all for now, Jeff. Thank you. You bet. Okay. I'm willing to be forgotten. That's okay. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. I think that's it on F1, unless I'm missing something. Thanks again for the uh, illuminating budget and the uh, the format as well. Yeah. Moving on. And then Mm -hmm. The only thing I would say is obviously we'll be updating it as we learn more and can make more accurate projections. Sure, understood. Okay, item F2 is resolution 2020-02, increasing the amount of the special tax for the fire protection and emergency services. Um, this was passed the, via ballot at the recent election. Does anyone on the board have any questions or comments about this? No. Jeff, can I add just one clarifying point? This sure. particularly wasn't passed at the election. What was passed at the election is the ability uh, recently for us to add our special tax amounts, whatever amounts those are, to our overall appropriations limit. These were included in the original ballot measures that the voters approved when they went to ballot. Right, good point. Thank you for the clarification. Okay. If there's nothing else from the board, does anyone in the public have any comments on this particular item? Yes, one second. Yes, Stephen, go ahead. This is, yes, item F2, this is the fire protection and emergency services tax measure. Okay, thank you. Um, so this, this again, um, what we have before us tonight is to be able to apply the um, uh, percentage equal to the Bay Area CPI to an existing um, special tax. Is that a correct statement? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, <clears throat> okay. so that's what we're here to um, discuss. Are there any further comments from members of the public? Yeah. Yes, there is, Jeff, one second. Mm -hmm. Yes, Bill. You need to unmute yourself. There, there you I go. am. Yep. Hey, I just had a couple of things comment about it. I says, any tax increases and all that for the fire department? I remember going back when we had a ballot issue of increasing the taxes to cover three additional firefighters. And I know Cameron Case spent an hour and a half on the phone with me the night before I voted and convincing my wife and my daughter and I that we needed to vote in favor of it to keep the firefighters and we did. And then uh, I know it was very close on the number of votes that went through like less than a half a dozen votes in favor. But the other thing I saw was if, I, if I'm correct, 
in the fire budget when San Rafael took over the Marinewood Fire Department, there was a $100,000 increase in what we were paying to San Rafael. And yet we lost a fire chief out of the budget, which was a couple of hundred thousand dollars a year. Why, and I never figured this one out, why we were paying more money for San Rafael to take over it and the whole bit. So I see an increase and I really question it. As far as the firefighters go, I totally appreciate it right now. They're not being in my window, but back a few years ago when I needed, my wife needed medical assistance at three o'clock in the morning, about every three weeks, uh, we had the Marinewood firefighters there led by Big John and he knew her condition and everything was beautiful. So I, my question is, do we really need a tax increase since we already gave San Rafael an extra 100,000 a year for us going under their wing and we lost a chief? So what would be 300,000 bucks or whatever? So that's my question is, do we really need it based on those numbers? Or is there something that I'm missing and looking at the budget? Or is San Rafael requiring more money out of us? Which is knowing San Rafael and uh, what I've seen happen with San Rafael. Yes, I can believe that. Well, Bill, um, if I may comment to you. Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, yes, we have had certainly a, um, an interesting relationship with San Rafael over the years, as you may recall. Uh, for well over a decade, we had a um, JPA with them in which San Rafael paid us to oversee the northern part of their city, um, north of Port Oswello Hill. And, um, you know, as things change, as administrations come and go, um, after the 2000 Y2K celebration in San Rafael, San Rafael found it no longer affordable to pay us in order to um, support that area and we stopped supporting it for a period of time. Then we got back into a JPA with them um, for no compensation whatsoever, which many people in this community were dead set against. Correct. And that has, um, to some extent, worked itself out and the um, relationship between our department and the San Rafael department, particularly once um, we chose to um, purchase chief services from San Rafael, I think has been beneficial for both departments. Um, granted, um, there are still those of us who understand the history who find this situation a little bit inequitable. But what we're talking about this evening is essentially simply trying to keep um, even with the consumer price index. Our goods, our services, et cetera, et cetera, are getting more expensive. We have to pay more. And this gives us the opportunity to stay even with the increase in goods and services in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers some of your questions. Well, I hope so. I just, you know, for us who are retired in the community that are on fixed incomes, uh, it makes it a little bit because everything that we're seeing is tax increase, tax increase, tax increase. In fact, I haven't even got my Social Security check this month, which is five days late. So I don't know if that has been discontinued. Oh so, my. You know, this is my concern, Jeff, and I'm sure that I think you're retired and maybe not. But uh, you might want to check that out, too. I will certainly do that. Thank and you. Tax increases, I keep seeing it, seeing it, and I know I live in a county which there isn't a tax increase or very few that the county does not like. Yep. And I'm in the minority. So I anyhow, that's my comments and feedback. I appreciate it. And thank you for your comments. Anything else from the public? Was that a no? No, sorry. You've had uh, the two people have commented. Okay, very good. All right, so we've had um, 
questions and comments from the board and from the public. Do I have a, a motion to um, approve this increase? A motion to approve the increase. Second. Okay. okay, we have a we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion by the board or question? Tiffany, if you could take the roll. Yes, I will. Uh, Director Green, how do you vote? Aye. Thank you. Board President Naylor? Aye. Thank you. Director Oysterman? Aye. Thank you. Director Perry? Aye. Thanks. And Director Shea? Aye. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. And then <laughs> Jeff? Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but just to be clear, what you guys have approved is resolution 2020-02, which is what authorizes the increase. Correct. I, I thought I said that at the top. Should I have mentioned it again? Uh, just as part of the motion. Uh, the resolution is the motion. Right. Okay, so now we're moving to F3, resolution 2020-03, increasing the amount of the special tax for um, park open space and street landscape maintenance. I would like to move to approve the resolution 2003 increasing the amount of special tax for far, park open space and street landscape maintenance. A second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Does anyone on the board have any further questions? This is very similar to the one we just, the resolution we just discussed. Hearing none. Um, is there anybody from the public that wants to discuss? Yes. <laughs> yes, Bill. Yep. Same comments. Ditto what I said the last time. I know it's going to go through because everybody in Marin County except me loves a rubber stamp tax increase. And that just means that I cut back in the spending I spend in the county because I need to live. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Is there anyone else? Yes. Yes, Stephen. No, I'm hearing you.
Okay, thank you, Stephen. Okay, um, is there anybody else, anybody else from the public that wishes to comment? No. Okay, then we have a motion to um, approve the resolution 202003, increasing the amount of the special tax for park, open space, and street landscape maintenance, and a second. Is there any further question or comment by the board? Tiffany? Rick Green. Aye. Thank you. Board President Naylor. Aye. Director Oysterman. Aye. Director Perry. Director Perry, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry, I. My Thank space you. shortcut worked before and now suddenly it didn't, so, oh well. <laughs> It's okay, we got it. And finally, Director Shea. Aye. Thank you. Okay. We'll move on to item E3. This is the district manager's report. F3. Um, F4, right? What did I say? E3. F. Oh, sugar. That's a typo. Sorry. F4. District manager's report. Okay. Uh, Again, the report's in there. Just give you a few updates on some of the things that are going on. I'm not going to go over all of them in detail. Uh, one of the things I will say on the AmeriCorps Fuel Reduction Crew Grant, uh, we've actually heard from our rep recently who had some fielding questions. Uh, obviously, this is still postponed indefinitely, but they are hoping to be able to pull something off. Um, we don't know exactly what that means, but we're staying in contact and hopeful that we can still bring out a crew uh, which would accomplish some major fuel reduction work along uh, the WUI interface for us. And then uh, on the park maintenance facility, uh, Bill Hansel and myself have uh, continued to move forward well, even in remote settings. Um, as mentioned in the report, um, you know, we've uh, contracted with a uh, structural engineer and We've also received proposals for geotechnical engineering. Uh, unfortunately, our structural engineer is quickly getting to a point where he's not going to be able to move forward without some needed geotechnical work uh, that complements his work. Um, so we're reviewing those and moving forward with the, uh, the minor geotech needs that we have to have done. And then we also need to look into some civil engineering needs. Um, all of this goes in so we can continue to kind of create the plans in place, uh, working towards the permitting process and then the actual construction. Um, I did apply and we are in the system. Um, as you know, the FEMA and the federal government uh, declared this as a disaster, the whole uh, COVID-19 situation. We are in the pipeline at this moment in time. Our reimbursable expenses are fairly low. Uh, and these are going to be things like the uh, overtime that our firefighters might work because they get called out uh, or held out due to either exposure or contracting of the virus and then uh, you know potentially some of our other sanitary expenses that are done in direct response but to be clear this is not for re revenue loss you know we can't claim that hey we couldn't do our rec programs this is for revenue spent in direct response and then uh, uh, the other thing I wanted to highlight here is the uh, Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority. Uh, Chief White will be talking a lot more about that, but just a note that uh, the operations committee portion of this has met. Um, I uh, participated as the representative for Marinwood. Um, Chief White was also involved, uh, although City Manager Jim Schutz is the formal representative on this, but there's several of uh, other subject matter experts that are involved in this process and helping to move it along. And again, there's more information about that a little bit later in the agenda. Otherwise, any questions, I'm happy to answer. Siobhan, go ahead. So even though gardeners can start doing garden work, the AmeriCorps is still on pause? A big issue with the AmeriCorps is the amount of travel that happens. These people okay. don't live locally and okay. also we house them okay. um, and then they have interaction. So you're talking about a decent sized group of people living within that, a common quarter. That's fine. I, I actually didn't realize that they had to come from far. I thought it was more of a local group. No, these people used. are from okay. out of state for the most part. Okay. 
Makes total sense. I take back my question. Hmm. Sorry, it's out there. <laughs> anyway, other questions or comments from the board? Um, with regard to the uh, Wildfire Prevention Authority, will you continue to be the representative for Marinwood or will the chief? Uh, no, it'll be me. It'll There's be one representative, uh, employee, uh, staff representative from each participating agency. The uh -huh. chief obviously is going to be involved, whether he wants to or not. Uh, he will be heavily involved, <laughs> and uh, he's obviously much more of a, a subject matter expert on this. But as it's written into uh, the measure that was passed by the voters, every agency has a representative on the operations committee, and it is uh, all staff. Uh, and primarily the agency's chief executive, either, you know, like in my place, the district manager, city managers, or in the case of independent fire districts, the fire chief. Right, very good. Who serves as the executive officer. Okay. Any other questions from the board with regard to the district manager's report? Hearing none, public comment? Yes. <laughs> yes, Stephen. Are you on mute? Yes, I can. Thank you. Are there any other comments from the public? You muted, Eric. Yes, there are. One second. Yes, Bill, go ahead. Yeah, I just have a thing is, Eric, do you have a budget for this project? I haven't seen one, and I'm just asking and during this whole thing, and I haven't been active in the participant out front on it, occasionally but i just wondered is there a budget anywhere and has the board approved this budget jeff two questions one to eric one to jeff eric you want to take that 
Uh, well, as we've discussed all along, in terms of the budget, it's going to be set by the market once it winds up going out to bid. When engineering and, uh, and the construction documents are completed, we'll be able to actually make much more of a accurate, for lack of a better term, estimation on what it will be. But until those things have been completed, it's it's hard to put all of those things together. So what you're saying is, any level I, of I have been in business for 40 years before I retired. In any project I started, I had a budget which I had to go in and justify. And I know there are things that come up, plus and minuses, costs, changes in time delays and stuff like that. But what it sounds to me is you have no idea. It could cost a million, 10 million, or it costs $25,000 but you have no idea what it's going to cost. You say, well, let's see what the bids come in. And you don't run a business that way. Maybe this is the way the public agencies do. When I ran a business, I never did it that way. Um, true or not true. Um, we understand what the outline of the building is going to be. We understand what's going to be improved and what's going to be outside, et cetera, et cetera. There are basic square foot charges that we could apply to this, but it'd be a guess, right? And it wouldn't cover um, some of what these um, engineers are going to cover, and that is what it takes to make sure that it's on a firm foundation, make sure that it's not degrading the creek bed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there are some unknowns at this point in time. So yeah, we well, could probably come up with an estimate, but it could be completely wrong at this point. That's true, but we could use an estimate, at least what are you looking at and trying to put a budget together before you spend taxpayer money. That's all I'm asking. I just want to bring bring back the uh, project with the firehouse kitchen um, that originally was budgeted for sixty thousand dollars, and we were not we have not received any. Um, bids whatsoever within the budget and um, then we just had to keep increasing it to um, see uh, what the market can provide given the limitation the public agency has to operate within. Isabel, I have one comment is going back is I had seen something about a bid in like $25,000-$35,000 for doing the kitchen. And it wasn't using Wolf and Sub Zero and stuff like that, but maybe a lesser expensive thing and a lesser expensive materials in doing the job. So that's what I recalled seeing. Maybe my memory is missing it, but I'm just asking the question as a person on a fixed income, paying taxes, that every time I turn around, I see another tax increase. And I go, there goes my retirement down another notch. And uh, maybe all of you that are retired, and I think probably there's one, maybe Jeff's the only one that's retired on there, is you've got a great resource out there to keep you alive and going. And I don't know. I know well, I, 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 I understand your frustration, but it was really, um, I, it's, uh, we were not able to accept the lowest bid because of the legal um, framework that we have to operate under. But I, I'm sorry for digressing so far of the manager's report. We are really not on subject at this time. I'm sorry. Okay, let's get back to the thing that I'm asking is, do you have any idea what it's gonna cost? What I'm listening to, Eric talked tonight, listening to Jeff, you have no idea out there how much this maintenance shed is going to cost you. Is that correct? Jeff or Eric? You're pulling it out and you don't even can't even do a swag on this thing. At, Bill, at this point, I do not have that information. You're right. And I assume Eric doesn't either. He can't even do a swag on it. So that's just my feedback. That's all. I understand. I'm sorry to upset the board with asking such irrelevant questions. No, I, I don't think your question is irrelevant at all. I, I do understand that it's very frustrating and we would like to move to the point where we have something tangible that we can present as quickly as possible. Do we expect that in the next six months, Jeff? 
Boy, I sure hope so, Bill. Well, we've only been waiting for two years for it, and we haven't <laughs> got that far yet. <laughs> so, and I don't expect it to happen in six months. I'll be very truthful with you. Thanks, Jeff. You're welcome, Bill. Okay, any other comments from the public? None? No, oh, you're good. Okay, so we'll move beyond the district manager's report then and to fire department matters, item G and B1, chief officer report and activity summary. Chief? Well, good evening, District Manager Dreykathan and Board of Directors. I appreciate the opportunity to share with you either the entire report bit by bit or the highlights of the report, depending on what your preference is. I know there are a lot of stats in the report when it comes to Pulse Point and some of the response data, so I didn't want to go line by line on all of those. But um, if you don't mind, I'll start just briefly with the shared personnel agreement to, uh, to skip the first bullet point about my recruitment and onboarding uh, just a month ago. So in a report I'm going to give shortly, um, right after this summary, the um, county is taking proactive steps in an effort to try to get ahead of the potential for loss of staff in Marin Woods, San Rafael, uh, and other agencies within Marin County in the event that COVID-19 has a detrimental effect on our staffing due to either individuals being screened and testing as positive or actually um, showing signs and symptoms of the coronavirus. And so as a result of that, as we've seen in the past, there have been agencies who've had to make some really severe um, decisions about service delivery based on the loss of staff, uh, either at a station or at a series of stations. I think we've been pretty good and, and, and we've taken a lot of proactive steps to prevent potential exposures with the way we approach patients and also with the steps we take to kind of decon and create hot, warm and cold zones uh, at our station. So I'm, I'm happy to report that even with our recent testing, not a single individual has tested positive who's opted to take the testing available for COVID-19 as recently as this week and last week. And so um, I won't dwell on that one right now. I just want to let you know that will be my information I'll follow up this early. But moving forward in the report update, um, for the month of April, the Marin County totals are 3,306 total number of followers on Pulse Point. Uh, I'm not sure if you understand how important and valuable Pulse Point is, but it actually provides the community with an opportunity for a initial response that's far greater and quicker than what may be the average response for an ambulance or fire department to be able to provide as a force multiplier of sorts with um, community members who have signed up for this um, ability to be alerted in the event there's a medical emergency or some other type of emergency uh, right in their vicinity. and so. As you look at the data here, there were CPR alerts totaling 14 that were sent, and the number of devices alerted to CPR events were 40. So that was 40 different individuals who had an opportunity to potentially respond to those 14 different calls to provide life-saving intervention care from either a basic life support standpoint or just CPR prior to the arrival of first responders. And so that's huge. I'd love to see the program continue to grow. And from what I understand, it has been growing. I don't have the data for the months of March or before, but I did get, I did receive the month of April data and I wanted to share that with the, um, the board of directors. Thank you. Absolutely. Can I ask a quick question? Yes. I may not under, this is Sivan, sorry. Uh, nice to meet you and welcome aboard. Thank you. Um, hope to actually meet you in person at some point. Hopefully. So 40, 40 devices were alerted. Do we know if anybody went and helped? That would probably take more data mining and I can okay. certainly follow back up with the individual that provided me with this report. Um, I would certainly hope so. I know some of the individuals that, that receive Pulse Point can be first responders themselves. Yeah. And just regular members of the public. So I would, I would, I would err on We hope, right. Hope so. <laughs> okay, yeah, I mean, it's nice to be alerted, but if you're alerted and you're like, oh, that's nice, but I'm not going to go help, that's Definitely. not really what the, po the point of the thing is, right? So okay. I just was wondering what our response rate was. Okay. And I'll, I'll try to find that information out and share it with you as well. Okay, just curious. Okay. 
Moving on to the next item, the Direct Connect pilot project. Um, there were unfortunately no updates available based on the pandemic. And so once uh, that is renewed and up and going again, I'll make sure I, make, uh, I bring the most recent information back to the board on that. Uh, the next item is the MWPA, Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority. And so um, given the recent passage of Measure, Measure C, which uh, I'm so grateful for, especially considering uh, what we didn't foresee with the pandemic coming and the impact it's going to have on all the jurisdictions and their um, resources. City, county, and town leaders have um, partnered with fire chiefs and established governing and operations committees. And the great thing is um, they're actually underway right now with several subcommittees. And I'm on one of those subcommittees, as um, District Manager Dreykerson indicated earlier. Uh, we're charged with putting together the work plan for 2020. Uh, we have a quick start and a work plan that we're developing right now, and it works across all five zones to identify those uh, priority projects that we can probably uh, launch immediately, as well as those projects that we hope to be able to get to um, after, say for instance, the RFP and the vendors have been selected who are successful in bidding on some of those projects that we have a, a sincere desire to see move forward and help draw down risk in our communities. And so some of those areas can range from roadside clearances to um, evacuation routes. It can be specific um, projects involving hiring staff, uh, for instance, park rangers, uh, wildfire mitigation specialists, and any number of other activities that support public education and community outreach, and a multitude of things that help to provide that big comprehensive picture of a uh, community risk reduction. And so with that, um, there's also an effort underway to recruit an executive officer that heads up this entire effort. But in the meantime, um, we've got a draft request for proposal that was shared from San Rafael with the other agencies so they could use that template in their efforts to move forward. And there are four key program areas and then two other supplementary areas. And those program areas are important because they compose roughly 60% of the funding that we anticipate from the MWPA. And those areas include emergency evacuations and notifications, unified approach to vegetation management, as we've spoken in the measure about the importance of having everyone aligned in their efforts moving forward within the county. Uh, increased education on wildfire mitigation. Uh, fire Safe Marin, the Ecologically Sound uh, Practices Organization and Sustainable San Rafael and multiple others were instrumental in providing guidance and information to get Measure C passed and moving forward. We're going to be looking for their input on how to effectively uh, move forward with those items that are, are part of the four program um, core areas. Uh, the other part is the, the access to matching grants. And I know that's going to be a heavy lift and that takes a bit more effort and time and coordination, but there are grant funding sources out there that we certainly want to be able to leverage and move forward for um, necessary projects that will help. I know CAL FIRE, as an example, had a major grant. Um, I'm not sure how much is going to be still available given the pandemic, but just even a year ago, they were speaking to the tunes of several hundred million dollars for um, vegetation and fuel projects. So we certainly want to access any funding that may still exist in those areas. The two additional areas, which comprise roughly 20% of each um, the 20 and 20 percent um, to round out a total of 100 percent are vegetation management inspections and evaluations of buildings, homes, and defensible space. And the last 20 percent is specific to individual agency specific needs. And so um, I'll give you an example. In San Rafael, we're concerned that there's a homeless encampment potential for ignition sources, and that could create a problem. And so one of the aims and goals is to try to get the uh, ranger position filled on either a fixed uh, term basis or a full-time, part-time um, basis in order to actually provide that enforcement capability to ensure that we don't have that sort of ignition situation uh, become a problem for San Rafael and any other community that we can potentially prevent those types of ignitions. Um, well, given that, uh, we have another ops committee meeting scheduled for this Thursday. The subgroup has been working hard, as I stated earlier, to draft the work plan for 2020. We also have uh, the emergency manager, Quinn Gardner, is working with several of the other staff uh, on our behalf to devise what the quick start plan will look like. 
And this information we're hoping to be able to bring forward to the board of direct, or excuse me, the governing body by May 21st. And at that point, we're expected we'll have uh, a lot more information in the way of funding, project costs, and other deliverables for that meeting. So I just wanted to give you an update on what's taking place with that uh, major undertaking. Um, moving forward in the report, we have the Marinwood Fire Department statistics for March 2020, and we also have them for April 2020. Um, kind of consistent with what we're seeing with some of the other agencies, there was a slight decrease in the responses that I noticed from the month of March to the month of April. And I think part of that is because some individuals may have had concerns about going to the hospital, so may, they may have not have opted to use the 911 system and or be transported because there's been a general theme out there that hospitals have been dangerous for um, people to go to and potentially be exposed to, to COVID. And so while I can't confirm, I'm just suspecting that might be responsible for roughly what appears to be about of a 20% difference in response data. I'll know more after the month of May and then the month of June to see if the trend is reversing or if this holds average. Um, I don't have the benefit of the information going back to February, January, and December just to compare the numbers. So I'm just factoring that in as a possibility. Understood. Chief, I have one question. Yes. Um, in both months, you mentioned that there was one suspected COVID-19 response. Um, was there testing done on our firefighters after each of these events? Um, I don't know that we did the specific testing on our firefighters. I think we may have provided the opportunity for those individuals to be tested. Um, and or if we suspected that they made direct contact with the patient as opposed to following protocol, that may have factored into the decision on whether or not we were going to test. The great thing right. is we, we actually provided some guidance early on to our, our personnel about how to approach from six feet away and how to make sure that the primary person that's providing care is the only person that's at that distance of six feet and the other remaining crew members are further back removed. Um, we provided a uh, face mask as an example for the patient to put on even before we started, you know, any um, assessments or anything else. So um, I, see. I could, I could certainly um, do some research and verify whether that took place but I'm not 100% certain, just as all of our personnel have an opt to want to take the testing that was offered initially because there were some concerns about mm -hmm. what that testing would be early on uh, and then maybe a false positive and some other, or false negative rather, and some other things that kind of made them want to just be a little patient with the testing process. I know certainly there were a couple members, including myself, who were tested, who were concerned about the swab and how far the, the swab, the Q-tip was going to penetrate through the nasal canal. So yeah. uh, the report, I didn't have any adverse um, issues, but one or two other individuals I talked to felt it was very uncomfortable. So, <laughs> yeah. I see. Okay. Well, thank you. Absolutely. Can I ask one more question? Sure. Um, so in terms of the two calls that we had that were suspected, um, we ha clearly, I saw that there was some areas in Marin where they were allowing other, um, other Marin firefighter and police officers to bring their vehicles to be decontaminated and stuff. Do, are we participating in that or how are we making sure that things are being cleaned out so that not only our personnel, but anybody else coming into the vehicles afterwards are being protected? Yes, um, some of the things that have taken place were specific cleaning of the apparatus and specific cleaning of the fire stations themselves. So decontamination, disinfecting, those things were actually happening at all of the stations. Okay. Um, I know at one point we were doing it weekly. I'm not sure if we're still doing it weekly or since we've uh, addressed, um, what should I say, best practices and proper procedure, whether or not that's still warranted until or unless you can confirm that you come in contact with a patient. And now that might prompt again the decision to go back for more decon and more cleaning of the facilities. Just to ensure you don't expose the crews and or the other crews and personnel who um, um, frequent those areas. Okay, so it's not every time there's a call we don't decon like the EMT vehicles and stuff? Uh, no, no, okay. no, but they're, they are taking a lot of proactive steps to wash their hands and follow all the other guidance. They're um, disinfecting a lot of the surfaces that they touch, whether it be door handles, whether it be when they walk into quarters after coming back from a call, 
they have a whole series of things they do when they actually take off the clothing that they responded in. And uh, I'll give you one example. There's a what we call the cold, warm, and hot zones. The hot zone is as you get outside the building uh, at the fire station when you return to quarters. The warm zone is the area where you actually start kind of decontaminating your boots and, and your shoes, as an example, by stepping on a mat that has a solution on it and you're kind of decontaminating your feet from any surface issues. And then your clothing gets taken and removed and placed in a, a different location as well. Okay. That, and then you move into the cold zone because you've actually taken those procedures moving from hot, warm to cold. And so um, they've been pretty good about following those procedures. And I've, I've encouraged um, everyone to continue to do their due diligence because I'm very concerned that as we still start to allow individuals to um, frequent certain locations or to start, you know, continuing with retail uh, interaction and things of that nature that um, I don't want the, the guard to be let down and then they kind of treat it as if things were pre-COVID when we're not at that point yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Understood. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And so that concludes the update. Um, and if you're ready, I can move towards a little more detail regarding the um, emergency agreement among the Marin County agencies and kind of speak to uh, in a summary of what the effort is there and why. Should we ask the public if um, they have any do questions? We need, um, do we need to, Eric, are you there? Yes. Yeah. Do we need to um, open this up for questions from the public for the chief? You do. <clears throat> you have one. Okay. Uh, one second. Um, yep. Go ahead, Stephen. Um, unfortunately, the only information I have is that it may have been started by a vehicle, but I don't have much more in the way of details regarding what type of vehicle or at what time that actually occurred. Um, but the great thing is we had, I guess when we showed up on scene, there were some other folks who had already been there and started to put water on the fire. Um, and we were able to get in and help make sure that this fire didn't extend. Um, so a rapid response was always, um, you know, it always makes a difference, but I don't have a lot of detail on what the actual cause or origin or type of vehicle was that may have contributed to that. You said it was in the middle of an open field. Um, there's no spontaneous combustion. Or Oh boy. I agree. I, I think um, rapid response, public education, and just people doing the due diligence will help prevent any potential. Well, I'm not going to start clicking on things. 
We'll just click on it for a minute. Go ahead and mute yourself, Bill. Did you click? Steven, are you still there? Go ahead. Okay, thank you for your comments. Um, is there anyone else from the public that wishes to speak? Okay, hearing none. Thank you, Chief. Let's move on to the next topic. Absolutely. Um, the next topic is regarding the emergency agreement, the shared services or staffing agreement among several agencies within Marin County. And as I was stating earlier, um, agencies as they recognized what was happening across the country and in other parts of the state and in other parts of the West Coast, began to you know, readily identify that there's a potential for us to lose multiple individuals to time off and away from work based on being exposed to COVID-19 and requiring isolation or quarantine. And so with that, you get into a situation where you've got multiple members within the same station or within multiple stations who are suddenly now forced to isolate and or quarantine for a two week period or more, it certainly affects your ability to staff and deliver emergency responsive services. And as such, the agencies started looking at how would we actually rebound or, or respond in the event one of our agencies was adversely impacted or multiple agencies were adversely impacted simultaneously because that is a very real concern even still, uh, despite the fact that things seem to be holding steady uh, this can change at any point. And so in an effort to be proactive, the, um, the county looked at trying to set a finite window for an agreement for uh, shared staffing or personnel roughly from May 1st until December 31st of this year uh, with the agreement being able to be extended or um, terminated earlier depending on how things progress. So with that, um, as you look at the rationale, uh, you know, as I stated, being gone for 14 days, whether it's two out of your three members or three out of your four members or 10% of your organization, as we saw happen in San Jose um, just a couple of months ago, that has a drastic impact on your ability to deliver service. And in an effort to ensure that we have staffing that's capable of integrating from station to station, from agency to agency, the shared services agreement uh, or staffing agreement, as I call it, uh, was developed uh, in an effort to try to get ahead of that potential situation. And so with that, there's been a lot of conversation, there's been some planning, uh, there's been some, I think, productive dialogue. Uh, but with that, there's still some concerns being articulated by the bargaining units, Local 1775 and others, about how procedurally that would work. And so those conversations continue right now. There's no agreement in place, but we do have language that we think is moving us closer to agreement. And the hope is at some point here in the near future, we're able to iron out an agreement. But some of the things I wanted to share with you about that agreement to you know, alleviate any concerns or answer any of the questions you might have are that any agency has the ability to opt out of that agreement at any point where they decided they want to. Um, every agency is responsible for the employment of their own personnel. You're not handing over rights to, uh, let's say it was Novato or some other agency to discipline and or um, compensate your employee. That's not how it operates. Um, compensation would have to take place after invoicing and within a 30 day window. Um, if any agency has to incur overtime costs as an example, because they've um, had to deploy some of their members to help another agency out, out because they lost staff, then that's fully um, re reimbursable back to the agency. Um, there's some training and familiarization that would actually have to take place for some agencies and personnel, because we do have some different apparatus. Um, fighting fire is not a, a very different thing in most agencies, but 
the equipment and the apparatus that we use sometimes can be different, whether you're talking about self-contained breathing apparatus or some of the other specialized equipment that we might respond to on a hazmat team or a water rescue response team or some other type of um, vehicle like a tiller truck versus a truck that doesn't have a tillered seat. And so that's I'm not sure if you understand what a tiller truck is. It's the individual that's steering from the back. And so that's specialized training and, and skill sets required to operate something on that scale. And so um, those are some of the things that that govern and outline what would need to happen in the event we were preparing for this type of situation. And so um, as you move forward and you see the goal and the, the complexity of it, I think the big issue is how do you effectively put something in place sooner than later, especially considering we're going to be facing uh, wildland season pretty eminently here, and we're going to be out for deployments. And if you combine deployments for strike teams along with any specialized response or a potential pandemic, you can see real quick where an agency might have some compounding problems with staffing relatively quickly. And so I think this is a very um, smart thing for the Marin County Fire Chiefs and uh, community and district and town and city leaders to entertain and try to come to arrangement on um, so that everyone's protected in the event something happens. No one agency is going to be impacted by losing critical staff. You'll always have the benefit of other agency staff coming to fill the void and helping with the response. Um, one of the only main impediments that exist is if an agency failed to maintain their insurance, as an example, that right there is a game changer. So, um, you know, from what I understand, uh, 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 District Manager Dragonson provided me with the information I needed, and that information is forwarded regarding our insurance and our ability to provide um, coverage for the Marinwood personnel and anybody that's coming to work in Marinwood. And so that that's a non-issue for us, but that was one of the things that stood out as an impediment. Um, as I indicated, the fiscal impact, uh, each uh, agency is responsible for paying their own personnel, but they can also receive compensation when they actually detail someone out to work at another station who's short staffed. Um, short of that, there's really no major fiscal impact. And so I just, at this point, I would like to really offer up, you know, my recommendation is, is that, um, given the potential, and, and I, I'm, I'm saying that mindful of the idea and the fact that right now things have leveled off, um, the potential still exists. And because of that potential, I think it's wise to entertain the agreement and, and have something in place as a redundancy or a backup in the event we do experience some significant challenges for any reason. So my recommendation would be that you authorize myself and um, District Manager Dreykesen to, to please allow us to execute this uh, agreement on behalf of Marin with CSD. Very good. Any if I, Jeff, Go if, I could, if I could just follow up really quickly on this, uh, and uh, Chief White touched on it, but to be very clear, I mean, the agreement that was included, I mean, that is a draft. There is still some language, uh, it sounds like, and some uh, meet and confer happening with 1775 uh, at a countywide level. My understanding is that the, the county reps are representing all of the departments, so it's not gonna have been scaled down to meet and confer needs on each individual employee group at each individual uh, station or uh, department. Um, it should also be noted that uh, this agreement is also being reviewed by multiple legal counsels. Basically every city, uh, town and fire district involved as well as the county council because the county of Marin is involved and they also provide our general counsel as well as Southern Marin. So this is going through a lot of legal vetting in addition to discussions with labor and uh, very, very similar to our agreement with Santa Fe that has already been in place for several years when it comes to staff sharing. Um, it is voluntary. No, no firefighters, at least at this point in time, can be mandated to go work for a different department. They uh, have to accept, and that is completely voluntary on them. Um, and then again, whatever we spend in overtime deploying somebody to another agency or department will be uh, invoiced and reimbursed by the receiving agent. Very good. Thank you, Eric. Um, does any, um, Sivan, you have a question? 
Yeah, just a quick question about the sentence that Marin would will incur a fifty dollars fee from our insurer for each certificate of additional insured created. So is that when we bring in somebody else? It's just each time somebody else comes in. No, 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 no. no okay, no. I'm sorry. To clarify, um, we have a fifty dollars administrative fee that we have to pay when we create a certificate of additionally insured for another third party or agency. This is for everybody. I mean, we have. I've taught my head six to eight different additional insured certificates uh, out there that name other agencies as additionally insured. Uh, there's okay. several agencies who name us as additionally insured. So when we create a new one, there is a $50 administrative fee that goes along with that. So how many more would we need to create? Would we need to create one for every single district within Marin County that we're going to be doing this year? Uh, I believe I believe we actually already have one with the county of Marin and San Rafael. So then it's just NFL. so it'd be okay. the remaining agencies, which I think is seven. Okay, so it's not a big fee. Okay, and this no. is just like you do it once, and then it covers the whole May through December. Uh, the it actually will uh, uh, yes, okay. yeah, it'll probably, it'll most likely cover the entire fiscal year once a final agreement is in place. Uh, the agreement as well as the request for the additional insurance will be sent off to our carrier. Okay, Great. Uh, just thank you for clarifying. Just to clarify, the same way uh, whenever we tap onto uh, human resources from another agency, we pay the overtime um, for, uh, which is the going rate at the agency, um, we, would, we would be, same way in this case, paying the prevailing wage of that agency, correct? Uh, well, we'd be paying whatever their rates are. Yeah. Um, so whatever their current employment agreement is, it's their it's their overtime rate that we are reimbursing. Basically, what they are spending in addition to uh, payroll taxes and other associated fees that go along with that. Okay. So in the exact same way that we bill back and forth, invoice back and forth with Santa Fe. Okay. Other questions. Uh, the only other thing, Jeff, that I would add to this is uh, I, I am with Chief White. I fully endorse and agree with this uh, and, and strongly recommend approval. Um, if you look at our agency, we have nine firefighters total. If uh, we lose a shift, we're down to six. If another one's sick, we, you know, we have one out right now on uh, paternity leave. Um, smaller agencies like ours could really be impacted really fast by a loss of. Uh, Available so are we approving you know this draft and it's going to change are we just approving the fact that this sounds good and that when the final draft comes we will to be clear to be clear you are going to approve this agreement in principle and then okay. you are authorizing myself and chief white to execute a final version of this agreement based on the information we've provided you at this time okay thank you for clarifying right one other question if i may um, with regard to training, I think we're going to be definitely one of the um, firefighting entities that's going to require quite a bit of training because of some of the equipment that we never use. How does training work? Is it when one of our firefighters gets in their on duty and another place they get trained while they're on duty? Or is there a specialized event where somebody just goes and gets trained um, when they're not on duty. How does that work? My estimation is it really depends on which agencies are adjacent to one another and how quickly you'll need to move people from one agency to the next. I'll give you an example. Marinwood and San Rafael already using the same equipment, already understand the same terminology. Um, but what does Novato Fire Department use? What is Central Marin? What is um, Marin County using in the way of equipment? And so. Um, I'm guessing that not everyone has the same self-contained breathing apparatus as an example. Mm. That being said, um, doesn't take long to learn how to use another self-contained breathing apparatus. It's the type, type of thing you can actually do that morning when you actually show up to work at an agency. I wouldn't really necessarily want to do that. I'd probably prefer that we provide training and familiarization, almost like a show and tell for individuals before they actually start with the agreement because you could get a fire the moment you walk in and now you're required to use that SCBA, you're not capable and trained. So I I see. show and tell and some form of training take place on a um, 
prior to basis. But again, what, and one of the things I should have mentioned um, is that in the event there's a vacancy in that agency uh, or in a specific agency, let's say Marin Wood, the opportunity to work the overtime will be presented first to Marin Wood staff. Mm -hmm. So that kind of helps prevent the potential for someone else having to come and show up. It's really in those dire instances where you don't have anyone in-house that's able to work the vacancy, but now you have to reach further out. Yes, uh, understood. Whether or, not, whether or not you're reaching out in concentric circles away from that organization who needs help, or whether they're going strictly down a list, that's what's being sorted out right now, I believe. Right, okay. understood. Okay, very good. Okay, um, questions from the public? Yes. Stephen. Thank you, Stephen. Are there other comments from the public? No. Okay. Um, then let's, uh, I'd like to entertain a motion um, to approve the draft emergency agreement among participating Marin County fire agencies to share personnel in principle and authorize the chief and the district manager to execute that agreement as it has worked out. So moved. moved. Okay, do I have a second? I'll second. Very good. Is there any further discussion? Tiffany? Uh, Director Green. Aye. Board President Naylor. Aye. Director Oysterman. Aye. Director Perry. Aye. And Director Shea. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Let's uh, move to G3. Appointing a Marin Wood CSD board, mem board director to the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority Board of Directors. Great. Uh, I, I left you a brief memo or staff report on this as well. Um, as part of the uh, as part of the measure that was approved, the measure C, each agency will have a member of their elected body on the governing board for the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority. Um, this needs to be appointed at a board level, and it's certainly again, it's an elected official, um, not an appointed or a staff official. Uh, so what we need to do right now is uh, have the board discuss amongst themselves and ideally appoint one of you. 
to serve in that capacity representing Marinwood on the MWPA board. Uh, their first meeting has already been scheduled for May 21st. I don't have the exact time in front of me. Uh, they're typically held during the day. Um, and I can try to get that information, but I will uh, obviously pass it along to whoever is there. And then Chief Weber from Marin County Fire has been doing a lot of the coordination at this point. So I will pass along the name and uh, relevant contact info for our board director. And I would assume you would be hearing from him shortly. And then to be clear, the May 21st meeting is the first meeting of the governing body of the Marin Wildfire Prevention Aid Authority. There's not been a board meeting um, to date, mostly because agencies are going through the appointment process in uh, formal meetings. I is this, is this going to be evening or usually in the middle, like noon-ish? Um, Just asking. Yeah, I, again, I, I don't have it immediately in front of me. If you can... Uh, Sorry, Eric. <laughs> All right. Uh, 3 p.m. 3 p.m. Yeah, that's okay. what time the ops committee meetings have been happening, and that is the time of the May 21st meeting. Uh, I, I can't speak to if that will be uh, a constant. I imagine that'll be something for the board uh, of governors as a whole to discuss once the board is assembled, but the first meeting has been scheduled for May 21st at 3 p.m. And where has it taken place? Online. It's Zoom. Online. Where, I mean, anything right now is a Zoom call. <laughs> yeah, it'll, be, it'll be a virtual meeting. Joy. And then to answer any? your question, Bill, I don't know where they would be if and when uh, physical meetings are allowed again. Hmm. Any idea about frequency? I believe once a month. Uh, Chief White might have more information on that. Yeah, I wouldn't see them having to meet more than once a month. Uh, right. I think the Ops Committee and the Technical Advisory Committee and the others are all working and, and pushing information up for decision making. But I don't, I don't know that they'd have to meet on a regular basis unless they, for whatever reason, weren't getting what they were looking for and made a, made a decision to come back sooner. I see. Okay, fair enough. Okay, do we have a volunteer? I mean, I'm willing to do it. I think it's an interesting thing to do. I just am concerned about the childcare situation. Um, but right now I can technically do what I've tried not to do, which is turn on a movie for my kids and do a Zoom call. But um, there's somebody else that they might be able to do this long term and I can, then I'm happy to okay. let them. I'm also happy to do it. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm yeah. sorry, I'm not able to do it because I work until, you know, 3 p.m. So, sorry. Well, don't let it happen again. <laughs> Jeez, I hope I keep my job. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This, this one pays so handsomely. All right. So we have two volunteers. Bill, are you volunteering? I could. Uh, I do have the ability to take whatever time I want off, but oh. it, you know, it just depends on when they start going to regular meetings, um, and how long this this indoor nonsense keeps going on. Uh, I mean, I can do it. Uh, does anyone have any, uh, I guess I'll just ask at this one, does anyone have any passion around this? This is an, you know, it's an important um, effort. Um, well, to me, it's interesting. Uh -huh. Just like all the other times that we've dealt with <laughs> pensions and fire. <laughs> Understood. It's all learning. Okay. Well, it sounds like everybody, except for Isabella, who cannot. So um, let's do this. Um, Leah, if you have the time, would you take this? Sure. Okay. I'd appreciate your uh, your expertise 
And um, I think you'd add some value there. Um, and it'd be good to have you aboard for this. Okay. Anybody else have any questions or concerns about that? No. No. Okay. And you're sure that you, you're not gonna have a problem time-wise or anything like that? Mm-hmm. Okay, good. We don't need to vote on that, do we? No, you should have a motion and you also need motion. to uh, request some level of uh, public comment. Ah, yeah, well, I was going to do that next, but um, okay, <sighs> let's do the motion first. I would like I, to move to appoint Leah Green to the uh, Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority, representing Marin One. Okay, do I, do I have a second? Second. Okay, um, public comment. Yes. <laughs> uh, Stephen, go ahead. Horses. Okay. Oh, yes. I would so. <sighs> oh, I I have so much to say, Stephen, but I will refrain. Okay, Stephen, thank you. Okay, we have, is, is there any other public comment? No, that's all. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. I'll motion to uh, appoint Leah. I think we already Leah. had, oh, already, okay. already, already. Already. I'm sorry, <laughs> yeah, we had a motion. Uh, Isabella moved and Bill seconded. Right. As, that, as I tried to say, we have a motion. Oh, and a sorry. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so uh, Tiffany, if you'd please conduct the poll. Sure. Uh, Director Green. Aye. Uh, Board President Naylor. Aye. And uh, Director Oyserman. Aye. Director Perry. Aye. And Director Shea. Aye. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Thank you all. Okay, um, item four, G4, data next fire commission meeting tentatively June 2nd. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Chief, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, Chief. Have, have a good night. Thank you. Have a good night. Thanks, Chief. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Chief. Pleasure meeting you all. Same here. <laughs> Okay, item H, park and rec matters. Recreation, uh, item one, recreation and park maintenance activity reports. Luke. Thank you, Jeff. 
Well, I'm just going to briefly go through uh, what the recreation department has been up to since we last met, and then um, you know we can kind of take questions. I'm sure will be items of uh, interest to all of you. Uh, but yeah, so the rec department has been uh, extremely busy uh, working from home mostly, and uh, we've been meeting extensively over Zoom and some phone calls. Um, one just responding to the to the current circumstances uh, which has required uh, some canceling of programs and um, a lot of communication with our program participants um, dealing with uh, refunds and um, dealing with our instructors um, a lot of which have thankfully been uh, willing and able to move some of their programs that can't be held uh, physically to um, virtual versions of their classes and we've been directing our participants uh, towards those websites and various opportunities to keep everyone engaged. Um, so that's been nice that we've had uh, the ability to do that. Um, but one of the main things we've been doing is planning for whatever summer programs uh, we will be able to have uh, once the health guidelines, um, as they continue to evolve. Uh, the main one being our summer camp program and of course the pool season. Um, so We've been working uh, with the, the community in Marin of other recreation and park professionals, um, meeting regularly on calls with the other agencies, as well as in the greater Bay Area with um, recreation professionals uh, there and, and all of California through the California Parks and Recreation Society. Uh, multiple meetings a week, uh, putting our heads together, going through the, the, the current guidelines um, and coming up with plans for how to um, potentially run some of our programs in light of the restrictions and the guidelines and trying to come up with a plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D, um, depending on what we're allowed to do that we can pivot and be able to um, actually put that, put that plan together and be able to offer um, whatever we can to our, uh, to our community this summer. So that's been a, a big undertaking with a lot of unknowns, um, but it's been, uh, it's been a fascinating process working with all these other agencies uh, to to kind of formulate some ideas and, and um, run things through each other and uh, we've come up with a lot of ideas and a lot of things so that's one aspect um, and regardless of what we're able to do physically here at Marinwood this summer uh, we've come up with a number of uh, programs that people can do that don't involve coming physically to the community center and running you know being involved in programs with our staff so we'll be uh, releasing those within the next month, but um, a number of family activities people can do, taking advantage of the open space, some um, uh, highlighting certain trails, uh, some hikes, scavenger hunts, and um, having some of our instructors lead virtual classes, et cetera, lots of those things. And we'll be announcing those as we finalize some of that stuff. Um, Robin uh, has spearheaded coming up with a virtual summer camp kind of program for people that aren't able to uh, attend physically whatever program we're able to offer. We've come up with sort of a program in a box that um, will engage with uh, some of our, our participants that, that weren't able to be here physically and, and let them uh, experience some of the camp uh, vibe and camp world and interact with staff and play some games, do some arts and crafts and things. And I'm really excited with how that's coming together. So we'll be um, announcing that in the coming weeks as well. So a lot of planning and uh, just being patient and um, as guidelines come in, figuring out how we're going to uh, make this work and what we can do. And it's been uh, extremely challenging uh, with all the unknowns in place, but, um, uh, but we are moving forward and, and uh, we do have a plan to run some semblance of our summer program uh, this season uh, while, while adhering strictly to whatever um, health guidelines are in place at that time. Uh, some of the main challenges with that are going to be, um, we assume at this point that there will be s severe limitations on how many participants we can accommodate for able to run a program this summer. Uh, so scaling down our program um, and dealing with some of the, the foreseeable guidelines with participants not being able to mingle and um, staffing. Uh, small isolated programs, no sharing of equipment, no sharing of rooms, all these things that we're sort of foreseeing, um, trying to come up with how can we accommodate that, how can we keep costs down and, um, and be able to do that. So those are some of the things. Also training staff in the meantime when we're not allowed to be in a room together um, is, is challenging and we've been working with 
a lot of other agencies and um, getting uh, information from the American Red Cross on how to conduct uh, CPR trainings, first aid trainings, um, while we uh, need to practice social distancing. And um, so we've been coming up with a lot of plans to, to be ready to go when, when the time comes. And uh, that's been uh, challenging, but, but also very interesting. Um, we released in May uh, just sort of a first trial edition of a digital newsletter that we've been kind of planning to do later in this fall um, as a way to engage with our participants uh, more often than with just um, you know specific emails about programs and with our big catalog that comes out in the mail and we uh, are excited to, to utilize that this summer to kind of keep people abreast of what we're offering um, and we'll, we'll kind of tweak that and add to it and we're excited to have that kind of new opportunity to engage and we will use that this summer um, to, to help us put some of these virtual programs out there and keep people um, engaged with recreation if we can all be here uh, together in big groups and special events and whatnot so um, Stay tuned for, for some more of those. Uh, the next one I think will be coming out early June. And um, Carolyn has done a lot of work putting that together and we're really excited for the, um, just to add that to our, our gamut of communication tools. Um, and so uh, that's sort of what we've been, uh, been working on is just all the different things. What um, our, our plan of attack, if it turns out we're able to open the pool this summer, on what steps we'll be taking to um, be able to accommodate the, the current requirements, um, what programs we'll be able to offer, how we're going to communicate that to the, to the staff, how we're going to, or to the participants, how we're going to train our staff to do that, and just having a lot of plans in place so that we're ready. And that's been taking up a lot of our time. Um, and then uh, as things are re relaxed, just um, reacting to that. So the tennis courts just opened last week um, because of the, the new health order, and we were able to um, uh, open those up with some restrictions and put the guidelines up and that was us working in conjunction with uh, all the other Marin parks uh, providers to uh, respond to the health order come up with language to put on the on the rules and, and uh, what kind of rules and regulations we could do to, to stay within the guidelines but still offer um, our tennis facilities to the community so that's sort of the way things go the, the new guidelines come out and all these agencies come together to say, okay, now how, what does this mean for us? How can we um, move forward with this? What, how, do we, how do we operate um, within these guidelines? What are some things we can do, if we can do anything at all? And so um, that's been kind of our process. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, yes, actually, I have a couple of comments. Number one, how in God's name can you um, monitor the fact that people are not going to share tennis balls? Um, we're not, uh, it's a great question. It's a great question. It came, it came up in discussion, um, but it's, it's very clear from the, the Marin County Health um, authorities that the guidelines are um, very relying on individuals to read the guidelines and follow them to the best of their ability. And we are not um, expected to become an enforcement agent uh, for, for the tennis courts. So we put the rules up and we ask people to abide by them. Um, and we hope that they do, but then we give them some recommendations. You know, there's, you bring red balls, I'll bring green balls, and we, you know, we try not to mix and match. So, right, but, uh, yeah, these are things that get that have gotten uh, that get discussed. So. <laughs> Indeed. Now, the other question I have is, um, and pardon me if I'm a little bit out of touch with this. My kids are quite a bit older than some of the ones that attend your summer camps these days, but. What is the efficacy of holding a summer camp without a swimming pool in the middle of summer? Well, Jeff, that's a good question. I mean, we, we're pretty lucky to have a pool on site. A lot of summer camp programs do not have access to a swimming pool, um, especially not daily access or even weekly access. So while that is something that I think makes our program special and unique, um, it's not a central aspect to many, many summer camp programs. So um, while if we weren't able to utilize the pool as part of our camp program, we would sorely miss it. Um, it wouldn't prevent us from being able to provide a bunch of other amazing activities and, and fun things. Thankfully, we've got this giant park, lots of open space, um, creek, forest, and we would plan to utilize um, all of that as much as we can this summer. Okay, all right, fair enough. I just wonder about, you know, it does get hot here and uh, <laughs> you know keeping the kids from overheating and that kind of thing is uh, i'm sure going to be a challenge but without a pool but um okay absolutely Fair enough okay questions 
from anyone on the board. I had a question. I just had a quick question. Oh, um, on the digital newsletter, I did not get an email copy of that. Like when I read about that in here, I was like, oh, that sounds wonderful. Is that a separate um, email list that that's going out to? Or was it like just a test one or is there somewhere else I need to sign up for that? Um, that's a good question. Yeah, yes and no. We um, were playing around with the format and, and the email list using our um, active net, our registration software that we usually pull from. Um, there are certain ways we can designate uh, who is receiving this, and, and we're, we're tweaking that. And the first go round um, did not get out to absolutely everybody we wanted it to, but um, it, it. Most, it was mostly camp centered. And we did um, find out that a lot of our, this is just kind of getting in the weeds, but a lot of, we found out a lot of our participants, like in our summer camp programs, were not uh, linked to their parents' email address the way it should have been. Like whenever their account was set up, it just didn't get set up just quite right. So we actually gone in and fixed all of that in the okay. meantime when we realized that it's, our distribution should have been much larger. So that actually was a great way for us to find that out that a lot of people were missing um, information just in general. So um, next time around, we'll be hitting a lot more of our uh, community. So you should be getting the next one. Well, thank you. you. You didn't miss a whole lot. Um, do you have anything that you want to offer on parks? Um, yeah, absolutely. So thank you, Jeff. Um, as far as the parks and maintenance department has uh, has been working during this shelter at home situation, it definitely limited uh, the scope of, of what we're trying to do and sticking just to what's been uh, highlighted as essential services. So we've scaled back um, and, and put a pause on projects uh, that weren't falling under that heading uh, for the time being. And we've had our crew rotating, uh, just taking care of monitoring the parks and uh, playgrounds and the pool, the building, all of our facilities, uh, just to make sure everything's in good standing, making sure that things are uh, clean and, and there's no vandalism or damage, emptying all the trash cans and dog waste bins um, uh, pretty much daily and, um, and then addressing any concerns that come up. We've had a few irrigation leaks and some other uh, repairs that have had to be made. So just keeping eyes on everything, keeping the paths clear, um, trying to keep the weeds at bay so that people can walk freely on our sidewalks and through the parks. And then we've had a few um, more major repair things that have involved a little bit more uh, attention. And then I was trying to keep, just trying to keep things maintained uh, for the time being. So that's been how we've, uh, uh, how we've been approaching um, parks maintenance during this time. And as they re relax the guidelines, we will um, be tackling more and more, um, you know, uh, projects and, and, and other beautification things to get us ready for the eventual uh, reopening of our programs and, and running camps and whatnot. Very good. Any further questions for Lou from the board? Sivan. Sivan. Just to confirm the back, Bathrooms are all and it's still available to lock down. So there's no need to be wiping down bathrooms and sanitizing because those have been closed to the public, right? Um, that's correct. Uh, currently, the park bathroom is closed, uh, locked to the public. The porta potty is uh, has been removed for the time being, and um, the community center is not open to the public. Uh, we do have occasional staff coming through, uh, doing various things throughout the week, um, and so the staff is sanitizing and wiping down the bathrooms just for the occasional use that that gets. But, um, but that's, that the bathrooms aren't at the pool aren't being used and, okay. and no other public bathrooms. And you guys will update us once Eric regarding the questions that I asked you before about camps, you guys will update us as you hear back from what, how we're going to do this once we get guidance. Yeah, well, everything again is going to fall, you know, with the guidance that comes from public health. I'm sure most people, uh, and if you didn't, there was a recent article that came out in the IJ about camps. And as Luke mentioned, uh, you know, they, our rec staff, Luke and Robin, are in constant uh, communication with all of the other agencies, not to mention I'm on a phone call at least twice a week that also involves the public health officer, the deputy public health officer, and uh, other various uh, level of staff uh, from public agencies across the county. Um, the, you know, the one thing I can say is uh, a, a summer camp will be allowed. Um, it will be open to all Marin County youth. Right now, the the handful of pop up child cares are only for healthcare and uh, first responder personnel. 
Um, however, the model of one week summer camp sessions just simply isn't going to happen. Um, at a minimum, they would be two weeks, but my basic understanding is that it's probably gonna be more like four week sessions where you will have to sign up for the entire four weeks. Um, they don't want kids bouncing around from camp to camps. Um, it's really going to be these stable groups. So for us, our capacity to serve, you know, really fall is going to fall under two categories. First and foremost is going to be staffing. Um, we're not going to have the similar staffing models where we have kind of a lead staff that say oversees multiple camps because they can't intermingle between camps. So we really need to make sure that for each group of 12, we have a solid staff person that can manage that. And then maybe a uh, not quite as experienced staff person with that person, as opposed to say to lesser experienced in a group. Uh, and then physical space by which to operate is gonna be a big deal too. Um, we've actually, uh, prior to you know all the pandemic, we had agreements in place to utilize some rooms at the middle school, I've reached out to the superintendent, the assistant superintendent and the middle school principal uh, requesting a, uh, a meet and discuss uh, regarding use of additional rooms, which would certainly allow us to serve more youth uh, staffing uh, uh, available uh, notwithstanding. Um, so we're working on what other avenues we can explore. I mean, you know what our community center is. We, we essentially have two rooms. Um, so the vast majority of things are going to have to happen out of doors. Uh, the one thing I would say is, you know, once these directives come from public health as to how they can be structured in maintaining these stable groups, um, again, my understanding, and I've been involved in some of these conversations, is there's going to be a consistent approach countywide. Uh, this is going to, you know, if it's four week blocks, everybody's going to offer a four week blocks, uh, you know, at least as far as the public agencies that are involved in this go. So there won't be, uh, you know, groups saying, oh, well, we're just going to do two weeks or, uh, hey, uh, we're going to do six weeks. I mean, everybody's going to do things uniformly. And there's been actually inspiring uh, cooperation and coordination amongst several different agencies. You know, Luke and Robin are on weekly, sometimes biweekly uh, calls and virtual meetings with these agencies. Uh, I have to take my hat off to Max Corton who is the director of Marin County uh, Parks and Open Space District. He's done a great job in coordinating a lot of this and has been very helpful in sharing information. Um, but I, I actually feel with some of our other info and having conversations directly with public health, um, we're probably a little bit ahead of the game in terms of where other agencies currently are. Um, but there's really, until we know what they're going to allow to do or what they're going to prescribe, it's hard for us to really say, okay, here's what we can do. Robin's been at work. We're operating under the assumption that it's probably going to be a minimum four week uh, session blocks that are going to be prescribed. Um, and we'll have to go from there. Okay. Very good. Other questions from the board? Okay, hearing none. Um, comments from the public? Yes. Yes, go ahead, Stephen.
Oh, okay, thank you, Stephen. Appreciate it. Are there other comments from the public? No, there are not. Okay. Jeff, if I could, if you don't mind, uh, just a couple of other quick points is that, uh, you know, and public health even references it, and we've been in communication with people running these. There are child care centers that are currently operating, um, and we've certainly been talking to them about some of their protocols that are put into place. Uh, public health, um, who's actually, in my opinion, done an incredibly marvelous job uh, guiding through a lot of this, has put together all sorts of guidelines, and these guidelines also include uh, very easy to follow checklists just in terms of sanitation and health checks uh, for uh, not only staff, but for participants, I would expect nothing less than that in terms of uh, summer camp guidelines that they're going to be putting out uh, hopefully relatively soon. And uh, also, it should also be pointed out that uh, our, our liability release language that's contained on all of our registration forms, we actually uh, queried counsel on this and sent that. So one of their things that they said is they've actually investigated this at a county level uh, previously. And, and as this current situation is a communicable, communicable disease, I mean, it, it doesn't necessarily present a level of a liability hazard. It's an assumed risk by participants. Uh, that said, they're looking at our language for any other updates we might want to have because we've been using the same boilerplate language for years and years. So that'll just uh, could possibly get updated if they see some uh, areas that could use updating. Very good. Anything else from anyone on this topic? Okay. Look, hearing, looking forward to hearing what the plan ends up being. Not, not nearly as much as we are. <laughs> right. <clears throat> okay. Um, item H2, the next PNR commission meeting tentatively scheduled for May. We'll move on to item I, board member items of interest, request for future agenda items. Does anyone on the board have any items they'd like to bring up? or request for future agenda items? No, thank you. Okay, I have a couple real quick. Um, in addition to those that Luke mentioned in his report, I'd like to recognize our preschool manager, Kate Kelly, who early on reached out to her class by distributing activity kits, almost as the shelter in place. Um, requirement was announced. Her dedication to her students is exemplary and deserves recognition. I just wanted to make that comment. And also in today's editorial in the IJ, um, they mentioned the grand jury follow-up report to um, salary requirements on websites and stuff. This was something that happened a couple of years ago and was um, addressed by our staff and I think at least one board member to make sure that we had everything out there on the website. While we were not specifically mentioned in this article, um, I did want to point out that we were not re-audited during this follow-up. Um, to me, that implies that our staff's efforts to get our information out there has worked and um, we're substantially in compliance. So I wanted to congratulate them on that basis as well. And I have nothing for future agenda items. Ms. Bella? I'm sorry, I forgot one important thing. Um, I would like to really thank Eric for all his hard work during these crazy times. I know that um, dealing with two small kids look the same for you you know little guys and working full-time is, is is tremendously tremendously challenging i'm fortunate enough to have kids that are older enough to be able to master the technology on their own so i don't have to be involved but um i hear from many parents how challenging these times are and um, therefore on behalf of the entire community thank you Eric thank you Luke and thank you to other members of our staff who are dedicating uh, very bizarre times during the day or night to get the job done 
I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Isabel. Thank Anything else from the board? Okay, are there any items of interest or request for future agenda items from the public? Yes. Go ahead, Stephen. Oh, interesting. Very good. Thank you, Stephen. Is there anything else from the public? No. Okay. I think we've reached the end. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Okay. Tiffany, one more time. Believe it or not. Sorry, I was writing out my motion and second. Um, Director Green. Aye. Board President Naylor. Aye. Director Oyserman. Aye. Director Perry. Aye. And Director Shea. Aye. Thank you. Very good, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for attending, your comments and your feedback. Thank you all, have a great Thank night. Stay safe and stay healthy. I'm saying. Night.